The covenant of Abraham holds immense significance to our faith. It represents God's promise to bless all nations through Abraham's descendants, ultimately fulfilled in Yeshua. It establishes a foundation for salvation, highlighting faith as the main element. It underscores God's faithfulness and serves as a reminder of His redemptive plan for all humanity. The following is part six of six parts in this teaching series. Well, welcome back to our last segment of this teaching. We've been talking about the covenant of Abraham and uh, how uh, that is the gospel that was proclaimed for, to Abraham. Now, covenant, gospel, Yeshua, Torah. I hope you're starting to see how all this really wraps in together. And uh, it really does involve you as a believer. How do you as a believer have a right to a covenant that God gave to somebody else? See, we've seen that God the Father, he, he kept that covenant. He was that smoking furnace that was walking between the pieces. And then Yeshua, that blazing torch, that light that shines going through there with him. And it was that covenant given there, how he could be a partaker of that. And Galatians 3 says that Yeshua came and he did what he did so that you could be a partaker of the covenant God gave you to Abraham. That's good news, people. That's the gospel, and that's the things that we're talking about. So the whole idea now is just to kind of say, okay, so what about the new covenant? The new covenant, is that something brand new? Is that something, you know, Yeshua came to give us a new covenant. I said, yes, I agree with you. He came to give us a new covenant, but what does that mean? You know, and I think we can all understand there are different meanings to the word new. There really is. We need to look at it. We need to understand what is being given to us. I mean, us as a Gentile, you know, who are not born from the tribe of Judah. What does that mean? Well, we, we got to learn. I, I am part of something. I am part of a people called Israel. It's because of the promises that God gave to us. Look at this. Hebrews 8.10 says, This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put what? My laws, where? In their mind, and do what with them? Write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Well, this is what we look at. This is what we need to understand. The Hebrews 8 says that I shall be a God to them, to who's the them? The people who have his laws on their mind, on their heart who have his word written within them. Isn't that being part of the covenant, the promises God gave to Abraham? Didn't Abraham come to faith the exact same way? Didn't he just walk in faith? Didn't he just listen to when the Father spoke and he did it? Isn't that the covenant that we're partakers of? So how does Yeshua fit into that picture to say this is something new? Hmm. Where did this originate? Jeremiah 31 tells us what the new covenant is. Read it with me. Look at it. This shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my Torah in their inward parts, write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. And I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. So how can I say that uh, verse Jeremiah 31, 33, and 34 says, well, that doesn't say anything about a new covenant. It just says that this is the covenant. Yeah. Jeremiah 31, 31 says this is the new covenant. This is what the Father is giving. So what's the word for new? The word for new is hadash. You know, kind of like a, a lot of you have heard of Rosh Chodesh. You know, it is something new. It is the head of something. It is something new. And the, the Greek word that fits that is kainos. It means newness of age. Another word is acher, the Hebrew word acher and chadash, they relate to each other. It means to renew or to rebuild or to repair. 
The idea of new does not mean that something never existed before. The idea of new means it is something that we have not been a partaker of before. Hmm. Even when we build something new, it existed in different parts, but we take these other parts and put them together and make something new. But the parts existed. What about the covenant? It existed. How about this? What about a car? You get a new car, but it's five years old. Is that a new car? It is to you. See, this is not a far stretch to say that something new is not something that never existed. It's something we need to understand in order to understand what the Father has given us. He has given us a new covenant. The thing is, the things that were on the outside, the things that were without, so to speak, are now to be written inside. That's the new part of the covenant. The covenant did not change. The delivery of it changed. Yeshua did what he did so that within men they could be a partaker of that covenant, partaker of that promise. He could forgive sins. He could take away these things. He can draw us near to the Father and make us clean and make us holy and purify us and cleanse us and allow that communion and that fellowship with the Father because of a covenant that was cut prior because of a covenant that was cut beforehand. The covenant that was given to you is a covenant of promise. It is a covenant of hope. But it is a covenant that God gave to Avraham many thousands of years ago. And that's what you're a part of. That's what you're looking at. Abraham had faith and he believed God. And that's how he came to faith. When I say came to faith, I mean he walked in it. What about us? We come to faith. We say we have faith. But what does that look like? Are we a partaker of something brand new? Yeah, every day. Every day, every morning, his mercies and his grace and his, his love, his greatness is new to us every day. But does that mean that it didn't exist before? It did exist before. We have to learn to walk in it. Romans 11 tells us we're grafted. What is a graft? <laughs> it's a branch that is taken and put into the tree. And it, the tree takes hold of that branch. And it, it encompasses that branch. It starts to give life to that branch. And that branch becomes part of that tree. Now, here's the thing. Romans 11, what tree is that branch being grafted into? That branch is an olive branch. That tree is an olive tree. It's Israel. And we're grafted into that. We're grafted into be a part of a people called Israel. And we can only do that because we came to, by faith, just like Abraham did, just like all the patriarchs and matriarchs of the faith did. We came in faith. We trusted the Most High God. But God said that because of that, He takes us and He grafts us into the olive tree. Not a different tree. He doesn't make a new tree. He doesn't take a branch and, and plant it and hope it takes root. He grafts us into the olive tree. And that's what we have to learn. You are a part of something that existed before you. Romans 11 tells us you're part of that olive tree. You're part of that life. You're part of Israel. You're part of the covenants. You're part of the promises. All these existed before. All these promises are for you. The promises that God gave to Abraham and established are for you to walk in. But the Torah, yeah, the Torah. Did Abraham keep Torah? He did. Remember, Ephesians 2, again, says, You who were once far off. You who were once strangers to the covenants, strangers to the promises. You didn't know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You served your own life. You went your own way. You did your own thing. And the time for that has changed. The time for that is gone. Once you give your life to Him, 
Now what? Now you live for Him. And you are partakers of covenants and promises and blessings. And His grace and His mercy is extended to you. And you are given a new life. You are given a new identity. You are given a new name. We need to understand that the covenant that the Father gives you, yes, it is new, but it existed before. The Bible is a book of covenants, not just a covenant. There are many covenants that are in Scripture. You know, you could talk about the covenant God gave to Adam, the covenant God gave to Noah. I mean, think about that. When God gave a covenant to Abraham, did he take away the covenant he gave to Noah? I mean, the last I saw, I still see rainbows. It still exists. It's still in force today. It still works, operates, and functions in every way that God intended it to. He extends these things to His people. And we need to walk that way. Because we, when we say old covenant, new covenant, we're cutting something off. Because when we say something is old, we think it is not necessary. I mean, it's sad, but it's true. And we need to understand that the word is necessary. I mean, if we were to say that the Torah is just old covenant, then the implication, the idea of that is that it is not in the new the problem is, with that thought, that it is in the new. I mean, every time Yeshua quoted scripture, every time he read in the synagogue, every time one of the disciples quoted something, where did they do it from? Many people don't realize how much of the Torah and the prophets are in the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah. It's full of it. More than three-fourths of, of the scriptures, the New Testament scriptures, are quoting from the Tanakh in one way or another, directly or indirectly. So why old? Well, look at this. Hopefully, this will change the way you think about this. 2 Corinthians 3.14 says, Their minds were made stone-like, for to this day the same veil remains over them when they read what? The Old Covenant. Because why? Because it has, been, it has not been unveiled. Because only by Messiah is the Torah taken away. That's not what it says. It says only the Messiah is the veil taken away. The problem is we, we've, we've been taught that when we give our life to the Lord, see, now we can understand the scriptures, but it's not necessary. And that's not true. What we need to see is that there's a veil over our hearts, that when we come to the Lord, that He unveils the Scripture. He doesn't say that the Torah goes away. He doesn't say that the covenant goes away. He does not say those promises were for another people. He says, when we give our life to Him, when we come to Him, the veil that was over our hearts when we read and perceived the things that were in the Tanakh, that veil goes away. And that, the implications of that is far-reaching because that changes the way that we live. That changes the way that we perceive things. That changes the way we do things on a day-to-day -day basis because we need to learn because uh, we need to understand that when we come into the presence of the Lord, it's His way. It's His life. It's His covenant. It's, it's His ideas. And He tells us how to live life to avoid the pitfalls, to avoid the sin, to avoid the danger, to avoid the things that keep us out of the path. And so when we turn and we give ourselves to Him, that veil is gone. Not the Torah. It does not say that the Torah goes away. It says that the veil goes away. And why is that important? You know the scripture where it says, and the veil was rent in two? Oh, wait, but that's just talking about the temple. The veil in the temple was rent in two to allow access through the Holy of Holies. And I agree, it was. Yes, physically, I believe that the veil was rent from top to bottom and it opened the way so that they could see that there is a better way. And what is that better way? That now every man has access to the Father because of what's written on their heart. Every man has access to the Father by faith just like Abraham was. It's the way we've always had access to the Father. But it was, it was just hard for those who couldn't understand God to walk with Him. And Yeshua came to make a way for exactly that, to walk with Him just by having faith. 
But that having faith does not mean you, you do away with the Torah. See, that's what we have to understand. We have faith. We should have the faith that Abraham had. We should. But how did Abraham walk? I think we need a witness. I think we need someone to establish how Abraham walked, how Abraham lived his life, how he did things. I would like to use as that witness God himself. Genesis 26, 5 tells us this. Look at it with me. Abraham obeyed my voice. That's Shema. He kept my charge. That's Shamar. To Shema means to hear with the intent of obedience. Kept, Shamar, means to keep, to guard, to protect, to preserve, to be a watchman, to place a hedge of protection around. So what did he keep? What did he guard? He says, my commandments, mitzvot, mitzvah. He kept the things that God had commanded him. What else? The statutes, the hokim, the hukah. What does that mean? Those are the things that, uh, you know, it's often explained. These are the things that we're told to do, and we don't know why. Does that sound like a custom to you? But see, hukah are, are often translated as decree, ordinance, that sounds like a legal term, doesn't it? But it's also translated as custom. What is a custom? But something that we do because it's just what we've always done. That's a custom. You know, God has customs. These are the things that He tells us to do, and He doesn't always tell us why. Why would God tell us to do something and not tell us why? Because He's just mean, nasty, rotten? No. Because He wants us to have faith. I believe there are things that if, even if he tried to explain it to us, they're just far above our understanding. We wouldn't get it, and we would mess that up too. He wants us to just do something just because he asked us to. And so Abraham kept, guarded, protected the mitzvot, the hukim. And here's the last one. It says, and my laws. You want to take a guess at what that word is? Torah. Abraham walked in the Torah of God. How can that be if the Torah didn't exist till Mount Sinai? Here's the thing. Torah existed before Mount Sinai. It was written at Mount Sinai. Remember, the word Torah means to teach and to instruct, to point out. What is the Torah but teachings? and instructions of the Lord our God. When God spoke to Abraham, He was instructing him. He was teaching him as a father would teach his son. Say, okay, I don't buy this Abraham thing. I'm going to walk like Jesus walked. Okay, how did he walk? How did he live life? How did he do things? Look at this. John 15 says, If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things have I spoken to you that, that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You know, um, a lot of people stop there. And there's more. They say, oh, the only commandment that, you know, Jesus gave us is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul and our might, and to love our neighbor as ourself. But we forget that part that says on these two things are hinged or hang all the Torah and the prophets. In other words, these two things, the other things have to exist for this thing to hang on. <laughs> the Torah and the prophets have to exist and have to be there for these two things to hang. So what are we saying? Well, let's keep reading. Back to John. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servant knows not what his Lord does, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known in you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he shall give it to you. What Yeshua did, 
He walked in His Father's commandments. He walked in His Father's love. You can read John chapter 14, John chapter 15, uh, 1 John, you know, it's, it's all there. And what we need to learn is Yeshua Himself said, I keep my Father's command. How should we walk then? Well, if we say all we need is to walk in faith, we already saw Genesis 26 tells us how Abraham walked in faith. Oh, all we need to do is to walk just like, uh, you know, Jesus told us, to walk in love for one another. Well, Yeshua said, this is love. You keep my Father's commands. That you do what I say. What does it mean to love the Lord your God? I think it means just to listen to Him. Just to have a heart for Him. When He speaks, we respond. We, when, when the Lord speaks, we don't just ignore Him. I mean, when God speaks, what happened at Mount Sinai? We can't bear to hear the Word of God. Let's not do that. Let's open our ears. Let's open our hearts. Let's open our minds. And let us see what the Father wants us to see. That covenant, the blessing, the life, God gave it prior to Abraham. Does that mean it doesn't involve you? No. It means exactly the opposite. It means that it does involve you. Because if we walk in faith, we walk the same way he walked. Abraham? Why all the emphasis on Abraham? Because that's what Yeshua came for. Back to Galatians 3. Yeshua came and did what he did so that the blessing and the covenant of Abraham could come on the Gentiles. And if you are a believer in the Messiah, then you are the seed of Abraham and heirs to that promise. A lot of food for thought. I pray that you take these teachings and you examine them further for yourself. Let's just cut uh, just one more thing. I'll just kind of add a little tag lag on there. Is that all right? Because I'm done, but I just want to like do a little fade out thing. So I pray that as you examine these scriptures that were given to you, that you do so with the heart and the mind and the intent of letting the Father reveal His life to you. Because the goal ultimately is, of course, to reveal the heart of the Father so that you can have His Word written on your heart and to live a life for Him, because isn't that what it's about? Advancing the kingdom, answering the call, living a life that glorifies Him, being a light where there is no light, walking in light where there is darkness. And we do that how? The same way Abraham did. Go to a place that I will show you, and keep walking, and I will instruct you along the way. Let the light be your path, and may the Lord keep you all your days. And I thank you for taking the time for this t to listen to this teaching. And I pray that you are richly blessed in it. In Yeshua's name. Well, welcome back to our last segment of this teaching. We've been talking about the covenant of Abraham and uh, how uh, that is the gospel that was proclaimed for, to Abraham. Now, covenant, gospel, Yeshua, Torah, I hope you're starting to see how all this really wraps in together. And uh, it really does involve you as a believer. How do you as a believer have a right to a covenant that God gave to somebody else? See, we've seen that God the Father, He, he kept that covenant. He was that smoking furnace that was walking between the pieces. And then Yeshua, that blazing torch, that light that shines, going through there with 